You don't get to see my face during the talk. Uh, my internet's so bad that uploading my, my video on my face kind of makes things choppy, so you just get my voice. Um, today, uh, we're gonna have like a short, about a half an hour talk on some tough uh, and, and good looking perennial plants uh, that you might consider if you live along the Front Range and some places beyond here in Colorado. Uh, most of these are gonna be perennial plants and then I have, and stuff that's close enough because I'm also gonna talk about a couple um, near shrubs that things that are actually woody plants that are actually shrubs, but they behave more like perennials. Um, so uh, if you haven't been on these Zoom talks, a couple things before we get going. Um, one, you've probably heard about Zoom bombing. It's been all over the news, people inserting weird, inappropriate things into chat or uh, sharing their screen with weird, inappropriate things. Um, to, com to combat that, we are going to have the um, the chat, the uh, chat be closed until about the last five minutes of the talk, at which point we'll open it up for you to put your questions in. We'll save plenty of time at the end for, uh, for questions. Um, if something does go wrong, I will end the talk, uh, or Cassie or Sarah will end the talk as quick as we can, just to get rid of whatever offensive thing hopefully doesn't get shared. And then, uh, and then we'll restart it, so you can rejoin with the same exact link that you had before. So. So as you're coming in, if you can make sure that you are muted and if possible, um, make sure your video is off. Mm -hmm. That would be great. Um, and with that aside, it looks like people are done trickling in, so we'll get going here. So, tough perennials for Colorado's front range. So I want to start with just, uh, just a little bit of discussion about what tough means or what I, when I pick things that I said are tough, what it means. Um, what I'm talking about primarily when I say tough is that they can withstand, um, withstand our climate, meaning oftentimes hot and dry summers, um, dry weather in the winter, uh, depending on where you're at, maybe they can tolerate high winds, things that are going to thrive um, mostly in the climate we have here in Colorado. And like this group of plants that I'm going to talk about could probably be just generally kind of fit in in the group of uh, plants, which we would call xeric meaning lower water use. Um, and they're generally plants that you could use in a xeriscape, which um, xeriscape, if you're not familiar with the term or you maybe just heard in passing, the technical definition is up here on the screen. Um, xeriscape is essentially a type of landscape design that we, uh, where the goal is to have little or no supplemental irrigation. Um, now, um, the technical definition there says or other maintenance, but I always cross that out because Xeriscapes need maintenance. Um, it's, you know, things have to be cut back. In Colorado, we do occasionally get rain from the sky, which means that you'll get sometimes weeds coming up in Xeriscape between your desirable plants, so there's still some weeding. Um, if, you, if you plant a garden full of these sort of plants, don't think that there's going to be, it's going to be planted and forget it. Um, another, um, oh, so here, I just, sorry, I just always throw this in because I think it's good to keep an eye on. We have the, um, current drought map for the state. Um, we are in the northern front range. Things are dry or um, not in drought. As you get further in the state, actually the south part of the state is in a pretty severe drought at the moment. If you weren't aware of that, you've probably heard about the wild, wildfires in the um, four corners. So water conservation is always something we should be thinking about. Um, I do want to also say that I, um, when I pick the plants for this, so essentially what I do, what, I, what, I'm, what I've done is pick plants that I have experience with um, and that I like. So in some ways they're personal favorites and opinions will vary. That's definitely true. Um, we do these talks on plant material. People have things they like. Um, not everyone likes the same thing. So if you want to find other plants that are in similar veins to this, there's some things you might consider. Um, if you haven't heard of Plant Select, a lot of the plants I'm gonna talk about are part of the Plant Select program or promoted by the Plant Select program, which is the partnership between CSU, Denver Botanic Gardens and the Green Industry of, Industries of Colorado which seeks to promote plants that are good for our area. It's a nonprofit. Um, the, uh, your local extension office can oftentimes give you advice on plant material. And we have a ton of fact sheets on tough plant material up on extensions website. And I'll send you links to that in the handouts for the talk. Um, uh, also, um, your water provider may have information and in particular Denver water and Northern water have really good websites on water conservation and tough plants. They both have uh, research gardens. Northern Water has a very nice research garden. So if you want to find out more 
these are things you can consider. This book here, you can buy on Amazon. This is a, a plant select um, compilation of their plants with pictures. And a lot of the plant, a lot of tough perennials would fall into, would be in that book. And you can, I think now it's two or three years old. You can find it online on, on Amazon or uh, local bookstores oftentimes carry it too. So I'm going to get into plants now. Um, and I, with one last kind of preamble, um, when I will just talk with this talk together, I pick perennial plants, but um, so a perennial plant just means that it comes back year after year after year. But I also think it's worth noting that not all, not all perennial plants are equal. Some perennial plants are long lived perennials. They'll come back for decades. Some are short lived perennials. They'll come back for three, four, five years. And then they, they naturally end their life cycle. So just keep that in mind. I'll try to point out, point out for plants if they're long lived or short lived. So, Fun thing about the short-lived ones is sometimes you can replace them with something else. It gives you a chance to kind of rotate stuff into your garden every few years, um, if that's something you're interested in. So um, a few other things. All these plants, even though they are tougher, will, will need to be watered until they're established, so through the first growing season. Um, and you want to make sure that you have an irrigation system that's designed to deal with these plants. So you might want to think about drip irrigation for these plants. Um, and then on top of just the plants uh, taking care of the site, um, so applying two to three inches of wood mulch, or in the case of some of these plants, if they're really heat loving, gravel mulch will really um, help them. Improving the soil will help for some of them. And for others, improving the soil with organic matter or compost actually will um, be a detriment. So I think that preamble took longer than I thought. So let's get into the actual plants. So the first one I, I wanna talk about is a plant that I love. Um, this is lead plant. There are several different species of lead plants you can grow in Colorado. It is technically a shrub, although you can treat it just like a perennial and take it to the ground every year if you like. Um, and a lot of winters you'll have to remove significant portions of it anyways because um, it won't come back. It's a member of the legume family. It has these pretty um, purple flowers that have uh, orange pollen in them. Uh, very striking, very drought tolerant, kind of a light green leaf color. If it gets too much water, it will spread and kind of not, I wouldn't say become invasive, but become aggressive in your garden. So it's one that really, once you get it going, you, you don't want to overwater. And that's true for a lot of these xeric plants, that if you, um, you overwater them, they're just going to um, become kind of a nuisance. Um, so lead plants, uh, there are species of lead plant that are native to the prairies of the West. Um, It'll grow in infertile soils, uh, heavy clay soils, uh, no problem. Um, I like it for the back of a perennial bed because it's a little taller, it provides a backdrop. The flowers um, kind of show up late spring and depending on the year, we'll go through sometime midsummer. Um, I was told by someone, I've never had much luck with this, that if you uh, cut them back as the blooms begin to fade, um, sort of like an aggressive deadheading, they will bloom again. Um, I honestly never get out there to head mine because I'm always too busy. So, but I've been, I've been told that by other people. So um, this is, you know, one lead plant. I also wanted to point out that this year plant select oops, is promoting a dwarf lead plant, which instead of getting the um, three to four ish feet tall that the, the normal lead plant gets, that the standard lead plant will get um, only tops out between two and three feet. It has a little bit lighter colored flower a little bit larger bloom too. So you can see it's, some people like that a little bit more, um, a little more pink in color, but otherwise it's very similar to the point it is talked about. So um, Plant Select again is promoting this this year. And if they're promoting it, that means that local participating Plant Select nursery should be selling it. I'll talk to you at the end of the talk a little bit about where to find some of these plants and how to find Plant Select selections. But I just want to make you guys aware there's a, a lead plant being uh, promoted by Plant Select this year. Um, the next one I want to talk about is a, is a truly xeric plant. So once established, it's not going to want to be watered, particularly in the winter, and that's Mojave sage. Um, again, this is actually a bit of a, it's really a woody plant that has woody stems, but you treat it very much like a perennial, so I'd include it in this talk. Um, it has these uh, pretty blooms. I believe it's actually the bracts of the flowers that are purple and showy there, not the flowers themselves. Um, and they're on the plant for a long time, um, from late spring through most of the summer. It has a very light green foliage, just a very western looking plant. Um, one that I really love uh, and is very tough once established. Where you'll end up with struggle with Mojave sage is if you plant it in a situation with poor drainage 
or we have a particularly wet winter. They do not like to have water in the winter, unlike a lot of other plants. So if you're gonna give this one a try, maybe plant it at the top of a berm where the drainage is better. Um, maybe plant it in an area with improved soil that you know drains better because it does not wanna be waterlogged, especially in the winter. And I think I have a close up. So you can see here the blooms are fading from bottom to top. So this is the very end of the, the bloom for the plant. Uh, but you know, but it has a long bloom period, and you can see the older spent, ball, spent, spent blossoms there at the bottom. I, I love this plant. I lose more of them, and we lose it in our in our demonstration garden more often just due to uh, wet winters. And it's not, it was we've always had it in a low spot in our demonstration garden. I think we might have better luck if we put it on top of a berm. So one of my personal favorites, and that's why I include it, was promoted by Plant Select many years ago. You can still find it at many nurseries that specialize in that sort of plant. Um, the next one I have here is Red Birds in a Tree. Um, and again, I can get you the scientific names of any of these plants, but I know these, these classes, the audience that we're advertising them to, you probably didn't really want Latin. So but if you do want them, you can email me after the class and I can get you the scientific name of any plant you want. But this plant's common name is red birds in a tree um, and just gets that name from the shape of the blossom. Um, it has a long bloom season, which is in our demonstration garden anyways, has a long bloom season, which is what one of the things I like about it. Um, it's gonna need a little more water to get established and then it's gonna, um, and then it, you know, and then you wanna taper off on the water. Um, I. I like this plant and I, why I choose to talk about it because it really is one of the few things with like that deep red. Um, it looks more like a lot of like mesic higher water use plants. Um, gets fairly tall, so it adds a little bit of height. And um, so it's good for kind of the mid-level of a garden or for an accent with the, with the bright red color. Um, we have it in our demo garden in an area that even has a little bit of shade and it's done okay. I, it doesn't bloom as much as it probably would in full sun, um, but it does, it's doing okay in that um, heart shade area. So just not one you might think about just for its unique flower shape and um, for the color. So I have more to say about some of these plants than others. So, um, so on this next slide, I have a, a whole group of plants I'm going to kind of cover at once. And I'm doing them an injustice by doing that because they all have their own little quirks. Um, but for a talk of this length, um, I just don't have time to get into details. And really, to be honest, I'm not the best person to be talking about the details of all the different species of penstemon. Um, there are a lot of them. Uh, penstemon come in many different sizes. Some are tall, some are short. Um, they have different leaf uh, texture. You can see here in this uh, kind of pin leaf uh, one here much more like lacy and delicate. Um, here in this this uh, one from the, I believe this one's from the Grand Mesa. I'm actually not 100% sure on that, but it has this broad leaf, uh, broad leaf that's uh, actually evergreen. So um, provides a little winter interest. Here we have like one of the Mexicali types, which are hybrid penstemons. Plant Select has promoted five or six of those now in various different colors, ranging from pink to deep purples. Um, the Bridger's Penstemon, which is red and has more of like the trumpet shaped flower. Um, so the, there's a lot of Penstemons out there and, you know, they're almost without, um, they're, they're all great. Um, they, they're not normally, some, depending on the plants you're growing, the species you're growing, they're not forever plants. They'll last for a number of years. Oftentimes they reproduce by seed. So you'll just, if you let seeds fall, you'll get seed coming up in the same area of your garden. Some of the Mexicali types in our demo garden have spread quite aggressively because <laughs> I think we give them too much water. Um, others, we've had, you know, um, some of the evergreen ones, uh, the prairie, uh, prairie jewel is one we've had that it lasts for a couple of years and then it seems like it goes out. Um, we have to replant it. Uh, there are many, so there are many penstemons, many are native, um, and, and they're, they're great plants for a lot of Colorado gardens. Um, Pollinators love them. You can see um, big, big old bumblebee here. And one of the Mexicali types, they were doing this out my front door this morning. That's not my picture, but they were doing it in my house this morning. So um, you should try a penstemon if you're getting into perennial gardening. Uh, there's a whole world of them out there, and you can find one that'll fit whatever color and whatever you need for your garden. So that was me totally not doing penstemons justice, but um, check out um, either Plant Select or um, High Country Gardens or any one of the other 
uh, low kind of low water west marsh trees, and they have a wide variety of plants available. Another group of plants that I'm going to kind of lump together are um, the hyssops. Um, there have been a lot of, the, and so this is the genus uh, Agastache, Agacity, you hear all those different names um, out there. Um, there are now quite a few different species of these on the market and quite a few selections. Plant select, I believe, is promoted four or maybe even five that have different colors um, and are members of different species. Um, some of them are members of different species, some of them are hybrids. Uh, they've got names like uh, Sonoran Sunset and what you know, so forth. So they all have these very nice pastel colors. The top picture here is a group of different ones kind of growing together in our demonstration garden at the Adams County Fairgrounds. Um, they are just the uh, midsummer showstopper. They bloom from right about now, maybe they'll, they'll, they'll really get going in a week or two through the end of the season. Um, their flower, the, the foliage has a very um, distinct smell. Um, it's nice. I'm not very good with smell, so I can't, it's hard for me to like figure out what to relate it to, but it's a very um, nice smell that I, I uh, people find enjoyable. The flowers are visited by hummingbirds and hummingbird um, moths, um, which is kind of cool, along with a lot of other pollinators. Um, some of the species of these are very long lived perennials. Others are, you know, they, they, they last for, you know, three to five plus years, and then you have to replace them. Oftentimes, if you let the seed fall underneath the plants, they, many of them come true to seed. So you'll just get, as the old ones go out, new ones will come in from seed, and they do stay true. Uh, many of them do anyways, stay true. So they'll come back in the color that you bought. Um, you know, even if you live in a little higher elevation, these are probably only good to about 6,000, a little plus fleet feet. But, you know, you can grow these as an annual at higher elevations even. They will fill in and be beautiful and maybe not, may not make it to the winter, but you can plant them again next year like an annual, even, you know, in those higher elevation sites because they are so showy. Um, one of my favorite plants in our demonstration garden, it just fills that midsummer um, need for color so well in a zero garden. Need a little more water to get established. And then once you get them established, you definitely can back the water off. Um, I'm not sure that some of those species out there are quite as xeric as people say they are, but most of the ones that are promoted by Plant Select are very tough and fairly xeric. So you can get them in all shades of the rainbow. This one down here is Sonoran, Sonoran Sunset. It's one of a little longer lived varieties. And I forget the names of all of them. I'm horrible with that, but all the, all the different fancy pretty names they picked out, you can find them on the Plant Select website. One I really recommend for beginners because it's a fun plant to grow because it's so showy. So the next um, plant that I want to talk about is another one. Um, like a lot of these, you can see there, I have plant selects photos up here. Um, they just take better photos than I do. Um, so this is a, um, chocolate flower is kind of a rambling perennial. You can see here it kind of hanging off a terrace. It has these little um, daisy-like flowers and it's ever blooming. So it'll bloom once it starts throughout the whole summer. Um, oftentimes, if you cut it back a little bit midsummer, you can encourage a, a stronger blooming later in the year. Um, so the flowers are pretty, it kind of rambles, that's nice, but the real draw and why, the, why this plant has its name chocolate flower is that in the morning, um, if you walk around to this plant, you'll get the distinct smell of chocolate, believe it or not, coming from the blooms. Um, and it's, it's strong. Um, and, and again, though, it's mostly, you mostly will smell it in the morning. So it's kind of like got that... Um, sensory uh, input as well with the, with the smell, not just the, the visual uh, display of the flowers, although the flowers are showy and attractive. Um, it can get pretty big, so you might want to might want to be aggressive at the end of the season and pulling it back. Um, don't be afraid if it's overgrowing its air, its space to pull it back and keep it in line. It, it will ramble, especially if it gets a lot of water. If it's growing too much for your, if it's growing too much for your uh, taste, feel, you can cut the water back and probably slow its growth down. Um, real kind of cool, interesting plant because of the smell, and again, very tough once established, very xeric, um, and pretty flowers. Ours in our demo garden, I think we have more trouble now with it over, the most biggest problem is that it kind of overflows its space and we have to pull it back every year. Another kind of interesting plant, uh, which you know, some people might even think of or as, as ornamental is curly uh, leaf sea kale. This is a, 
um, plant that I believe is native to Eurasia. And I, I know it's been used as an ornamental in Europe for a long time, but plant selected from promoting it here for maybe a little over a decade. Um, it has this uh, blue group foliage. It is kale. It's edible. I've ate it, and it's a little more bitter than the kale that you would grow for, you know, dietary purposes. Um, it is a perennial, though. It comes back every year. It can get pretty tall, um, up to three feet. It gets covered in these um, showy white small flowers and these uh, inflorescences at the... Um, uh, I think actually it's right about now. Um, it's annoying. Oh. As the weather warms up. So I think someone had a little microphone come on there. No big deal. <laughs> um, so. I'm sorry. So I'm just making sure everyone's muted. I don't, I think it sounds like there's a child involved. So I won't, I won't call out the person by name, but anyways, um, so it's got a kind of, it's a dual purpose of the foliage being showy when the, when the flower is not in bloom and the pretty white flowers. Um, this is fairly tough. In our garden, demo garden, it's at the top of a bluff where it doesn't get much irrigation and it just kind of thrives over there. It will spread by seed if you don't deadhead and get the seed out of there. So you will, you will find that you have to pull it up. And it gets, again, taller than you expect, um, about three feet or ish tall. And it's kind of like an interesting plant. You can look, I've got ornamental kale, you know, and there's lots of ornamental kale on the market now, but this one is um, a little more uh, a little more xeric than um, some of the other ones that are out there. So, kind of a cool plant to consider um, for the texture and the flowers. Okay, so a um, a plant that probably a lot of people are familiar with, which is a, a also a very tough perennial, is echinacea. Um, I have here just a, a very standard pink flowered echinacea, um, also called cone flower. Um, if you deadhead them, they'll have a fairly long season of bloom. Um, you know, they are fairly xeric. I would say during our, during, you know, long periods of drought, they're going to need to get a little extra water or they start to look pretty sad. Um, they also can self seed quite readily if you don't, um, if you don't deadhead them and get the seeds out of there. Um, tall, rigid plant, showy daisy type, um, daisy type flowers. Uh, I mean, it kind of speaks for itself, right? When it's in bloom, it's, it's very attractive. Um, this is the standard, you know, uh, light pink colored echinacea, but these days there are echinacea on the market ranging in color from, um, you know, yellow to like a bright unnatural orange red, to all, you know, pretty much all the shades of the rainbow on the market these days for echinacea. Um, so you can find it whenever color you like. Um, it is going to, you know, it's going to be easy to find. And it's like in our demo garden, um, it comes up from seed every year. It seems like in new places. And sometimes we keep it. Sometimes if we like where it is, and sometimes we pull it out. Um, also, a little note about echinacea. There, there are other species of it. In fact, Plant Select promoted a one recently um, echinacea, I believe, um, it's a, uh, ten uh, tennisiensis, I believe, and it, uh, does a, does a cool thing where the flowers, um, move during the day, and it's a little less of a, I'd say it's a little less in your face showy, but a very, like, understated pretty flower, uh, as well, so, um, a lot of echinaceas out there, and if you're just getting into zero gardening, it's a good one to start with because it's hard not to have success with them. One that's not quite as common, um, but is one of my um, favorites, uh, personal favorites, I just have a soft spot for it, is um, Baptista. So Baptista is a member of the legume family, so the beans and peas. Um, and I read on the internet actually this morning when I was reviewing for my talk, um, somebody called uh, Baptista redneck lupin, which I thought was kind of funny because those flowers are very similar to like lupin. They're all in this pea, beans and pea family, but it's just... Um, not quite as showy and you know it's a little more wild of a plant well lupin's a pretty wild plant too but i just i thought it was an interesting description so you can see these these p-type flowers in the spring they're on the plant for several weeks um and you know are, are very showy and then what i what i like about baptista is that you know after they're gone and, and you, you deadhead this the fruit pots out 
Baptista adds a really soft, mellow um, texture and color to the garden. It's a very light green, very soft textured plant. So it's a good backdrop. It's a good like negative space amongst all your color for midsummer. So you get a spring bloom and then the green texture midsummer. Baptista is also um, pretty much a forever perennial. Once you get it established, it's going to be where you put it. Um, it's not going away. And it is, it is very tough like once established. So um, just I, one I have a soft spot for and a very tough plant. Some people don't like it because the bloom, the season of bloom is not as long as some other perennials, but I think it fills a nice niche in the garden. And I was trying to add some variety to the plants I was talking about, not just all the, um, not just everything uh, for its flower as the, uh, the focal point. Although the flowers of Baptista are nice. So a plant that I wanted to mention briefly, and I'm running out of time, so I'm probably going to go pretty quick for the last couple here, um, is um, autumn, autumn Amber Sumac. This is a, a, a selection of Rus trilobata. Um, I put it in just because I think that, honestly, it's one of the best low water, tough ground covers that you can plant. Um, it's native to our foothills here, and so it can survive under native moisture. It will fill in an area easily. This autumn amber has a nicer fall color and is a little more of a ground color cover. So if you're looking for a ground cover to take over a space that's not going to need much care, this is the one I would recommend and go to. Um, pretty fall color, keep, will keep out weeds once established, very xeric, it's a win-win-win. So even though it's not technically a perennial, it's one I just wanted to throw in for that niche. If you water them, they'll get large. So if you, once, you know, if you don't want them to take over, don't give them too much water. Another ground cover I wanted to mention briefly is wine cups. Um, this is kind of a vining. It doesn't climb, but it kind of just will spread across the ground. You can see why it gets the name wine cups, right? These, these showy kind of cup-sized flowers, uh, which look kind of like, you know, wine. Um, this, if it gets water, will spread. It will be very aggressive. We had whole giant patches of it we used to have in our demonstration garden before we ripped it out. Um, so it's good for kind of filling in an area, um, covering an area, and again, it gives you these showy flowers. Uh, I would say quite, quite zero, quite tough once established. So the last couple here. Um, so this one, I just, I, I am just shocked by this, that every year it just seems like they find more beautiful ice plants to introduce. So um, if you aren't familiar, these hardy ice plants, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, they started get inter getting introduced by Plant Select and some of the nurseries. Um, it used to be like the yellow ice plants were kind of spotty here in the winters, but there's been a big effort to select these colorful ones from other places in the world and introduce them. Plant Select, I think, has introduced six to eight or eight of them now uh, in colors ranging from kind of like this pale pink to a vivid purple to um, this kind of raspberry color to orange to bi colors. Um, and they are just showstoppers. They form these, they're, they're succulents. So they have these like succulent green leaves and then they're ground covers. They will spread quite, uh, depending on the one you're growing, quite, um, aggressively if they get water. Um, so they're good to kind of either like the foreground or to fill in spaces between your other plants in a perennial garden. Pollinators love them. I was watching just about a, uh, last week, um, many of these, the blooms close at night and then opening in the day. And I was watching the honeybees waiting around for the blooms to open. They were kind of buzzing around and trying to force their way in um, in the morning. So they're, they're good for pollinators. A lot of these plants are that I'm talking about. And they, they just add a lot of color to a zero garden. You can see how many flowers they put on um, per square foot. Um, they will be killed. If they get too wet, they can be killed. Um, if they get too, too dry, especially in the winter, they can be killed. So you got to watch them a little bit. Um, oftentimes, they'll just be the, the low spots that die out. And maybe you have, to, you have to backfill in every few years, planting more individuals into the center of the plants where you've you know, the plant is either like grown out from that area or, you know, died in a low spot. So if you plant ice plants, be prepared to have to maybe fill in with some plants over time to fill in blank spots they leave as they spread. So I think another one, if you're just getting into Xeriscape, it's a super satisfying um, plant to grow because it's so tough and it's so showy and you can get it in so many different colors now. So last couple plants here, I couldn't, um, I had to, you know, talk about Denver Daisy. This is a, a uh, this is Rutabachia is another name for it. Denver Daisy is one plant select promotes that has a little more brown in the center. You can also get them that are, have just yellow petals. Um, this plant is not a true perennial. It'll, it'll stick around for a year or two, 
but mostly it comes back from seed. Um, I would say that, you know, there's two things about this plant from growing it now almost 10 years in our demonstration garden that I've learned. Uh, one, it is a midsummer showstopper. Whenever, whenever, whenever the, one other things, you know, when it gets hot, it's one of the most showy things in the garden. Um, in our demonstration garden, it is also one of the worst weeds. It comes up everywhere and we have to every year thin it out only to the places where we want it. So, you know, you might be able to combat that by um, deadheading it and getting the seed out of there. Or alternately, if you want it to fill a space, you might be able to spread the seeds in that area and get takeover. Um, there is a native um, rutabecchia, which is, the, you know, the one that Denver Daisy comes from that Plant Select promotes. Um, also, it's great in containers. Um, you know, I, I think it's just another one of those, if you're getting into Xeroscape, this is one to think about because it's easy to grow, it's very showy, and so it's very satisfying and uh, native. Ooh, I didn't realize I had a graphic in there. Um, so the last one I want to talk about, and I did this the order a little wrong, I was trying to group all the ground covers, is another kind of mounding ground cover plant. Um, this is hummingbird trumpet creeper. Um, it's got these long flowers that attract hummingbirds, um, light green foliage, and it'll spread. I think I maybe the picture's not showing up. I had one from a distance. It'll fill in quite a space if you let it. Um, pretty red flowers, great to see the hummingbirds at the plant, and, and very xeric. I have one here in my yard that actually um, pretty much gets no supplemental water and it's always been pretty much happy as can be. So um, another, another cool ground cover you might want to think about um, with a little more red flower color. So I wanted to give you some options there because I know a lot of people are looking to fill in an area that maybe was lawn or something and they want more ground cover plants and this is one you could use for that. So finally, I know I'm a few minutes over and I'll be very quick on this. I got asked in the run-up to this talk, I got emailed by several people questions about uh, tough plants, meaning like deer resistant, like what plants would tolerate or not be browsed upon by deer. Big problem, I know, for a lot of people along the front range. My folks live in Colorado Springs and I mean, the deer pretty much dictate how they garden, right? Because if, you know, you have, if, you're not, if you're not planting things, that the deer don't like or um, not protecting them from the deer, which is mostly what they do, um, they're going to be gone. So um, for deer resistance, there are two things that, you know, that besides like trying to use repellents, there are two things, um, three things really you can think about. One is protection. So that would mean either putting up a fence around a certain part of your garden that maybe you're trying to just keep the deers out. So like, you know, if you do it around your backyard and you have a smaller area within the yard that's like, this is my garden for stuff that I know the deers want to eat. And you put a, you know, a, a six or eight foot fence around that small area, right? To keep the deer out. Um, I'd recommend the taller, the better, <laughs> based on my folks experience. So exclusion is one thing you can do, but for a lot of us, that's not what we want to be thinking about. Um, you can plant things that are, uh, they'll be more, they'll be more deer resistant if they're aromatic. So they have a strong smell or they have thorns. Uh, and thorns aren't a guarantee. I've seen deer very daintily um, eating the flowers off my uh, mom's wood rose, woods rose, which is a very thorny rose if you're not familiar with it. But by the same token, she plants barberry, which to be honest to me, barberry is just a plant I wouldn't want to plant. I'm not a big fan of it. And that's but what's in this picture here. It's so thorny and they leave that alone completely. Um, so some examples of such plants. So this is Russian sage. Not one of my personal favorite plants, um, which is I know some people love it. So if you love it, I'm not telling you not to. But um, it is um, generally fairly deer resistant. Um, and then here's yarrow. It's another uh, one you might consider if you want a yellow color that's pretty deer resistant. We have a whole fact sheet full of deer resistant plants. Um, you'll notice if you start doing research on deer resistance that nobody says deer proof. There's whole books. And, uh, they're not titled deer proof. They're all titled deer resistance because with animals, including deer, if they get desperate, they'll go after even things they find unpalatable or less palatable, right? So it's just a, it's just a matter um, of how hungry they are, right? Um, how desperate they are before they start going after, you know, your Russian sage even or something like that. So those are kind of my tips on that. And I'll make sure to send out the fact sheet too with the handout when I send it out for the, um, this week's talk. So with that said, um, if you have questions, my email's here on the slide. These are just some ideas. I did want to show you real quick, and I'm going to go to my um, internet browser. This is Plant Select's website, 
Um, and you can find if you, again, I can only cover so many plants half an hour, but if you want to find a lot of information about plants, you can go to their website and go up here up top where it says plants, click our plants, and um, you'll get a list of plants that you can be pretty assured are, are fairly well adapted for the uh, Mountain West. And on here, they have everything they promote. And if you click on individual ones, like here's Coronado hyssop, we talked a little about hyssops. It has some tips. It has like a description, right? And then it has some tips from the pros, like don't overwater, don't overwater this. <laughs> um, and then it has down here also, that has elevation guides. Cause I know not all of you probably live um, along the front range. Some of you are in the foothills. So it has elevation recommendations for all their plants as well. Um, so I think it's a great resource if you're looking, if you wanna see pictures, cause they have pictures of everything they promote. Um, you can also go to uh, find a plant here and it'll like let you put in what color you want and things and it'll give you a list of plants that have blooms of that color. And you can also find a list of participating nurseries here. So you can find good local nurseries that sell these plants. So anyways, um, along with that, there's also resources on extension websites, um, our extension website and um, uh, Implant Talk Colorado. So anyway, so with that, I will uh, I'll answer questions for 10 or 15 minutes here if people have them. Thank you for, uh, for tuning in if you gotta get out of here, so. Let's see, I'm gonna go to the top of the question list. Eric? Yep. This is Wama Rose. Thank oh. you. Thank you for the talk. It was very informative. My one question is why didn't the irises bloom this year very well? I had a number of mine that never bloomed. So that's a good question. I noticed it was spotty too. And um, if Cassie wants to chime in, she's welcome to, but I put it up to that mid April frost that we had, maybe damaging some, um, damaging the blooms as they were just about to um, deploy, so to speak. Oh, okay. I, don't yeah, know if I actually had very good iris bloom this year. So I hadn't seen that in my neck of the woods, but I wasn't in Adams County as much as I normally am. And mine so was spotty. I, I would say April, April pre is very likely. Yeah, because I had some in the back that were slower and I had great bloom, but a lot of my southern exposure ones, I have very few blooms at all. Gotcha. So maybe those were a little bit further along because of the... Uh, the sun exposure, yes. That's right. Yeah, that's what I figure. So, um, okay, yeah, so I, that's my best guess. <laughs> all right, thanks. I see a bunch of questions in the chat here, so I'll try to um, answer them. So hopefully, um, Beth, your question about where to purchase, I would use um, I would use the Plants Like website, and you can use that to find the closest nursery to you, depending where you're at in the front range. A lot of the local nurseries, almost all of them, to be honest, are Plant Select participants, and they will sell them in some quantity, but sometimes it's limited. So um, if you want to email me where you live uh, after the talk, like generally your municipality, I could tell you two or three nurseries that are close to you. Um, Jody said, thank you. Thank you, Jody. Um, soil requirements uh, for Agus, for the Sunset Hyssops. Um, so they are going to prefer a little uh, more well-drained soil. Um, I see them do well in berms. Um, they are not super picky. I do not think they want to be in pure clay, though, that just doesn't drain. They're going to prefer, you know, a little bit. So it's they, really they want it drier in the winter is what that means. Um, so a little bit of soil amendment or whatever won't hurt them. Um, they like it hot, so using gravel mulch and things around them is totally fine. Um, Dan Danielle says that hyssop smells like black licorice, and I totally agree. That's what that that's the smell I was looking for. Um, um, Natalie wants to, to test your soil. Uh, Natalie, if you go to if you just um, Google, I put um, the link in. Oh, perfect. So Cassie already gave you the link. You can use the CSU Soil Lab or Colorado Analytic is another good local lab. Uh, Paul asks if Russian sage is a tumbleweed. Um, no, I wouldn't say so. It doesn't like break off and tumble. It looks like a tumbleweed to me, which is one of the reasons I don't like it. Um, plus, I think it's kind of unruly, but it's not uh, actual touch uh, tumbleweed. There is Russian thistle that is a tumbleweed that actually is a weed weed like in agriculture. That might be what you're thinking of. Hi, this is Marie Turner. I live in uh, Fort Morgan, out in the country, and I was wondering what perennials are good for um, grasshopper infestation. I, I live out 
around fields. And yeah, I sure. Grasshoppers that are really bad. And I don't like to use spray. I, I like the bees and birds and stuff. So. Um, Sure. That's a really good question. I need to do some research on grasshopper resistance. I probably can find a list for you. Um, again, if Cassie, if you have any ideas, but I don't, I've never actually looked into grasshopper resistance for perennials before. Um, okay. They are a pain to control even with chemicals, to be honest. So um, I know they're a fact of life for a lot of people. Uh, some years they're worse than others, obviously. So um if you wouldn't mind um, either uh, just shooting me an email to remind me to send you some information on that, I'll dig some up for you. Uh, hey, I'd be cool. happy to. I'd be happy to do some research for you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, and I've really enjoyed the talk. Thanks. Well, thank you. Let's see. Um, so I think I got out of order on, oh, on the questions here. Go back to where I was. A lot of people saying thank you. That's nice. Um, a lot of people talking about different tumbleweeds. I'm glad you guys got to talk about tumbleweeds. Kosha is one of the big ones for sure. Um, any honeysuckle girl well here? Somebody asked. Who was that? Judy. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of honeysuckles grow here. I don't know. Honeysuckle is the common name for a lot of different plants. We have honeysuckle vines you can grow here. Um, other flowers uh, get that common name. So I, I don't know, I can't, it's hard for me to answer your question because I'm not sure which honeysuckle you mean. Um, there are a lot of honeysuckle shrubs that grow here as well. Um, yeah, so it's hard for me to answer that. But if you want to, again, if you want to shoot me an email with a specific picture of a plant or if you can figure out a more specific name, I'm happy to tell you if it can grow here. Um, we record this and it will get up on YouTube. Yep. Uh, a question from Danielle about do any of these plants do better with hail than others? Uh, it depends how bad the hail is. Generally, plants with smaller leaves um, do better with hail, just, you know, as a rule. Plants with larger leaves tend to get more hail damage. Um, uh, plants with stiff, thick leaves tend to get more hail damage than plants that can kind of uh, bend and uh, with the breeze. So most of these perennial plants can be knocked back with hail, and they're going to come right back in a month or so. So that's a great, that's a good thing about these perennials is that most of them are pretty resilient. So um, if you need even more, look for smaller leaves and more or uh, flexible leaves. Someone asked the difference between Denver and Northern Water. Um, there's different water providers. Denver provides the water for Dem the city and county of Denver. Um, and Northern Water is a big water company. They move water through um, uh, uh, different various tunnels in the in the Rocky Mountains and Northern Front Range to, to provide water from Loveland on out to Greeley and beyond. So they're just a big water provider. Um, and so their interest in conservation, of course, is they're selling water and they want to make sure that we they have enough water to meet the needs. So they want people to conserve, which is why they've taken interest in these um, things. Um, Gwen wants to know fewer hummingbirds this year. I have no clue. I have not noticed that. That's an interesting observation. An interesting observation about that. I have not noticed less hummingbirds or um, like heard about anything going on with them. So, sorry, I don't know. Um, and planted some young native perennials. Low water, long term. Um, so, so the question is about watering advice for young perennials. Essentially, I would water when the when the top inch or two of soil is dried out. And so depending on your site and the weather, that may be every other day, that may be once a week. Now that it's hot, it's probably every other day or so. But when it's cooler or it rains, obviously it'll be less, but there's no substitution on watering, just sticking your finger in the soil and just seeing what the soil moisture is. And once again, once the top couple inches are dry, it's time to water. It's hard to give a real like standard recommendation on that because there's so many factors that go into it. Got it. I did. So I, someone talked about. So a steward asked about sedum. Um, so I didn't talk about sedums. There are so many sedums, and there are, many of them are wonderful. They're succulent plants. Um, they're worth trying. Uh, if you need to cover a large area, though, Stuart, I would not recommend. Um, I would not recommend sedum for a large area. I'd be thinking about. Um, like a, a tough native grass, a tough uh, tough grass, like um, 
like a, a gosh, crested wheatgrass. Um, depending how big your leach field is, like you're probably going to find that a grass for an area like that is a little easier to maintain. Um, so that'd be my first instinct. Um, if you want to try something a little prettier, um, most of the plants that I talked about would work in terms of ground cover. You could think about wine cups, autumn amber sumac, um, or again, um, like a tough dry land perennial mix that has things like crusted wheatgrass in it. That'd be my recommendation. Crusted wheatgrass won't mind just bad soils there either. Um, to fill in, so Samuel wants to know to fill in along a path, ground, ground cover a short grower. So the same ones I just talked about, I might think about um, either um, hummingbird trumpet creeper, uh, wine cups, or autumn amber sumac. Um, you can also try the ice plants. You can plant a variety of ice plants. I'm not really sure how big of an area it is. Um, but you might try the ice plants. Some of the um, Turkish uh, veronicas are good ground covers, like they'll grow into the cracks of the plant of the stones. Um, those would be my suggestions there. Chickens for the grasshoppers, yeah. <laughs> um, so a lot of. Uh, a lot of the plants, so I had another question about deer resistance. A lot of the plants I talked about are going to be somewhat deer resistant because they're aromatic or et cetera. I'd say penstemon is not particularly deer resistant. I'm just trying to think back through the list. Um, I see deer, I, they're probably less of a problem with things like lead plant because they've got woody stems. I've never seen deer eat Mojave sage. It also has woody stems. Doesn't mean they wouldn't if they were desperate enough. Um, so uh, the hyssops are aromatic, which probably makes them deer resistant. Um, echinacea is often on the list of deer resistant plants. So again, a lot of them probably are pretty deer resistant, but um, I'm probably forgetting some plants. I can't speak to every single one of them. I will send out the fact sheet that has a pretty comprehensive list when I send out the handouts for this talk. Um, fancy grasses. Um, yeah, so in terms of ornamental grasses, I didn't talk about it for this talk, but my favorites are little blue stem big, and big blue stem. And there are selections of little blue stem and big blue stem that are promoted now by Plant Select and other nurseries that, um, that uh, are like prettier in the fall. That's the reason I like them is they're low water use and they get bright red um, to an, a kind of fiery orange in the fall, depending on which one you plant. So those are my two favorite ornamental grasses. There's also Blonde Ambition, Blue Grama Grass is a nice one. Um, and those are probably the ones that I know that aren't super aggressive. Yeah. Carl Forrester is boring and been planted over planted, but I don't, I don't think I'd call it aggressive and it's fairly tough too. Hey, Eric, do you mind starting the poll? Oh, okay. Yeah. Hang on. Launch poll. Okay. And I'll keep going. I can do a few more minutes of questions here. Um, Susie wants to know safer ways to windproof vines and other taller plants while growing. I mean, it's pretty much just trellising. Um, if it's a vine, you know, making sure your trellis is strong enough for it. Uh, you can tie it to the trellis with twine, which should be good enough for almost any situation. I mean, if it's a, if it's a vine, it should be able to attach itself to the trellis pretty strongly anyways. I'm not sure specifically what you're struggling with, but maybe if you could send me an email with what the specific plant you're struggling with is. Um, if it's a tree that's tipping in the wind, uh, you can stake it. I wouldn't stake it for more than a couple of years though. Oh, roses for the front range, Linda. Uh, I'm, I'll tell you what my favorite rose is, and that's um, red leaf uh, rose, which is uh, a shrub rose with pretty pink flowers. That's my personal favorite. Um, but shoot Cassie and I an email and we can get you in touch with, um, oh, we have a talk coming up on roses, but we can also get you in touch with our Rose Squad, which is our dedicated rose loving master gardeners who can give you really good advice on that. So growing stuff to grow under, under spruce trees. I'm gonna be honest and in those shady spots under the trees, my biggest, thing that I like to do there is just mulch, right? <laughs> um, and not try to grow a bunch right underneath the spruce trees because it's so shady. And the number of 
plants that are xeric and do well in shade is really small. Um, there are some out there like um, creeping mahonia is one you could look at, um, but it's just a hard spot to be successful. So sometimes those like shady needle filled spots under the spruce and pine trees, I personally just like to leave them with mulch and plant stuff out in the sun, not under the trees. That'd be my suggestion, but again, you get, uh, uh, I just said the name, Mahonia, um, also called Oregon Gray Poly. Small, cute flowers that can survive in the heat. Um, so, you know, I think that the ice plants have kind of small, nice flowers. Um, there are lots of other, um, uh, and there are lots of other ground, uh, you know, kind of smaller ground cover type plants that you can um, grow, but a lot of them are spring blooming. So if you're looking for stuff for the heat, I like, I like the ice plants. Um, I think of them as cute. You could look at uh, First Love Dianthus, excuse me, First Love Dianthus, which is a plant select promotion um, out there uh, that has little smaller kind of cute flowers. I even think some of the penstemon are kind of cute, cute subjective, so I may not, my definition may not meet yours. Um, if the hyssops are showy midsummers, midsummer if you want, uh, showy plant, uh, showy, um, showy color midsummer as well. Mix I would recommend for Colorado wildflowers. I just generally, honestly, and this is somewhat personal, do not like those wildflower mixes. I just don't think people have a lot of success with them, period. Um, and, you know, really what is a wildflower, right? Like, um, there are wildflowers out on the plains, but, um, you know, I don't know, is it, you know, if the wildflower mix you bought was for uh, Michigan or even the foothill, or even if it was for, like the Colorado mountains, that's not the same as out in the plains. So, um, you know, I'm not the best person to ask about that. You might talk, um, email, look up Irene Shonley, who now works at a, a, for extension in El Paso County, or send me an email and I'll forge you her, I'll get sent you her email back. Um, she's really good with um, a lot of those native plants that are not, that are very niche, that are not necessarily my specialty. Um, yeah, Cassie responded to that. Um, so like you're trying to, so Clint sounds like he's trying to fill in a, uh, like a strip between the street and the house. Um, what I would recommend actually is to go either to Denver Water or to Plant Select's website. They have pre-made plans for for those uh, hell strip quote unquote areas um, that will that are plants that are well selected for it. Um, so if you go to Plant Select and then you like go to Design, they'll have a pre-made garden there for a hell strip. And I think Denver Water has one as well. And I, I think those are plants are great. So I would look at something like that because you you could get quite a variety of stuff in there wine cups or something like that would fill in if you just wanted to do one plant and let it fill in. Just put the link for that into from Plant Select into the okay. chat. Awesome, thank you. Shrubs or ground covers under pine trees. Like I said, Mahonia is probably one of your best bets. Other shade-loving perennials, um, you can try choke berry. Uh, a shade lover, shade and shrubs, choke berry. Um, you could even try like smooth or Annabelle hydrangea. They're not xeric, but you could try those. Um, there's not a great number of plants that are xeric for shade though, like I said. Um, Danielle says she has a perennials mulch, but how she gets, how do they get them to receive themselves? Um, so yeah, you might just have to kind of either pull back the mulch or if it's like me, the mulch gets thinner over the years. I don't know if it's, if there's a, if you're talking about mulch with landscape fabric underneath it, it, you're going to have a hard time getting stuff to reseed. Short of pulling up the mulch and landscape fabric, it's going to be very difficult to get stuff to reseed in that situation. If it's just wood mulch over soil, you might like, you know, kind of either pull back the mulch and shake the seed heads in there or uh, just kind of maybe agitate the mulch to get the seed heads to fall through to the ground. Flowering vine ideas or colorful vines. Oh, there are a lot of vines you can you can grow. Um, so I got to bring them to the front of my brain. Um, uh, uh, silver lace vine is a beautiful vine in the fall. Um, in the spring, uh, you could try look for, look at uh, Kenzie's ghost, which is a type of um, which is in the honeysuckle family. 
uh, that's a pretty one. You could also, if you want a little thicker stem vine for like a, a wood uh, fence, you could consider um, uh, humming uh, trumpet flower or trumpet vine. Sorry, trumpet vine is that one you might consider. Um, I can make a mental note to put the vines fact sheet in the handout we have too, for sure. Under pine and spruce, ask loving shade loving plants. Um, so I've talked a little about that. Um, so one of the, just a brief note about acid living is actually that's a myth that under pine spruce, the soil gets acidic. Um, it would take literally tons, you know, thousands of pounds of needles to make the soil, most Colorado soils, at least if you live in a part with clay alkaline soils, um, acidic. Um, usually what kills stuff under pines and spruces is um, shade, dryness, and then smothering by the needles. Um, but, um, I think I already mentioned some of the ones. Um, I think one of your best bets, again, is going to be Oregon Grey Poly. There are other ones, and I'm sorry, my brain is blanking on some of the other ones, but um, Oregon Grey Poly is a good one, uh, and it doesn't get too aggressive. Um, so it's, it's one that I really recommend for those sorts of situations. How do you tame your columbines, Susie asks. Um, well, I mean, yeah, once you get columbine established, it just comes up from seeds. So the big key there, if you've already had seeds fall for years and years and years, you're just gonna keep having them come up from seed. If it's a new plant, you can try to deadhead it so the seeds don't always fall. Of course, the plants themselves don't live forever. So you kind of do want some seed to fall so you keep getting columbines. So um, it's gonna be a hard uh, hard thing to do to, to tame it. Um, So, but yeah, getting rid of the seeds is the best way. Let's see. Um, I just see an email from Susie about vine, about the vines again, drawing them out. Yeah, clematis and hydrangea vines, those are not xeric, not tough plants. So um, I would not uh, recommend those if you have high winds or bad, you know, um, or tough conditions. I see there's 41 more questions. I'm just going to be a struggle for me to get through all these. Sorry, guys. Or there's 41. They're all questions, some are comments. I'm supposed to say hi to Sarah from Cary. So, hi, Sarah from Cary. Um, yeah, so Jennifer, if you have sandy soil, you may have to water every day with just a little bit of water during the first season, for sure. Sandy soil just drains so fast, you may have to water every day. So keep an eye on it, but my guess is, especially during this, the heat of the season, that could definitely be the case. Keep grass out of the bed. Uh, I don't know that there's a ground cover that'll necessarily outcompete grass, but um, if you plant like that autumn amber sumac or the wine cups, it'll definitely um, like, reduce the amount because it'll shade it out because they're just a little bit taller than the grass. But I don't know that I have a great, you know, bluegrass is a very aggressive plant, it turns out. So I don't have a great advice for that besides good edging and um, consistent pulling. Um, our demo garden carry is at the Adams County Fairgrounds, which is nine. Put nine. the address in. Okay, <laughs> 75 Henderson Road. Cassie did it already, thanks. Um, uh, Judy, not much luck establishing um, columbine in front sunny beds. Yeah, I mean, I feel like columbine is not as heat loving as you know you think it would be because it's a native plant. Um, it might like a little shade. I, I've struggled to be honest to get columbine to establish in some beds. Um, I think it would like a little bit cooler environment to get established. Cassie knows a little more about columbine than me. If I'm if I'm wrong about that, please just yeah. Columbine is definitely a partial shade lover. Um, if you have areas where there's a little bit of shade, especially in the evening, or if there's some part of your yard that's going to have a little bit more moisture, especially in the early half of the year, then you're going to have a lot more luck. You can go for the red one, which the name is skipping from my head. That one's more tolerant of sun than the blue and blue and purple ones are. Cool. And actually I was wrong. There was not 40 more questions. So I think that was, I think that was it. So thank you all for sticking around. There's a lot of you sticking around to hear me babble here in the question section. I appreciate it. Um, we have another talk next week and I will get the handouts uh, for this out to you, hopefully uh, late today or early tomorrow morning. I'm going to try to be good about that. Um, appreciate everyone coming. If you have questions, email me or check out the extension website. Have a good rest of the day and a happy 4th of July too.